Good afternoon. How are you all doing today? If you can see me, if you can hear me, if you can see my screen, put it into the chat, let me know. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. Hi guys, how are you all doing? Thank you there, Silvanus. You can see my screen all right as well. <clears throat> you know, one thing I like to do is while you are, while everyone is streaming in and we'll wait a minute or two for everyone to get in, uh, let me know where you're joining us from, right? Let me know where you're joining me from. I always love to find out and to see where is everyone from. Super. Keep it going, keep it going. We've got all of you in here. I hope everyone will let me know where you're joining us from. I just like to know where's my audience coming from. <clears throat> hey, Gary, how are you doing? Hey, Robert. All righty, one more minute and we'll get started. Today is the Trading Strategy Clinic. So I hope you have questions. Let me know if I can help you with you know, your trading strategy, if I can diagnose something for you, guide you through or tweak, possibly tweak your trading strategy, maybe it'll help you with your trades. So, you know, I hope you have your questions ready as you're putting in where you're joining us from, get your questions ready. I'll share with you how I approach the markets and then, you know, you can share with me your trading strategy. I'll see if I can add any value to that as well. Good morning, Okiri. All right, super, super. Now glasses are cleaned, let's get ready. Today is the ultimate Forex Trading Masterclass here with Tickmill. As usual, before I get into any webinar or when I start any webinar, quick disclaimer, any information or materials provided is for informational purpose only and it should not be considered as investment advice. Right, the views, opinions, or information expressed in the text or um, things that I share with you moving forward is solely that of the author myself, <clears throat> not of the employer organization committee or the group or individual or company. So what it basically means is that I will be sharing with you some trade um, or how I approach the markets, how I look into possibly jumping into some trades, what you should be doing if you are looking into any trades is doing your own due diligence. Make sure you check your charts, check your analysis, make sure you trade with the right leverage. Don't over trade, um, watch the margins, right? So do your own due diligence before you jump into any trades. We can't be responsible for any profits or any potential losses that you might make. <coughs> with that, um, again, this is the trading strategy clinic right so if you have any questions please feel free to ask into the chat or into the q a i will you know i look forward to seeing your questions or you know even knowing how you trade maybe i can add a little bit to that to help you get more profitable with your trading okay uh, what i'll also be doing is i'll be sharing with you how i trade um the different ways I look at the markets, the different um, trades that I look to jump into as well. All right. So just a quick introduction. My name is Jin Dao. Most people call me Jin. Um, I'm one of the traders here um, at the Everest Fortune Group. I do. I have had a fund which I traded before, and now I do full time trading and analysis. So please let me know. You know, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to help. With that. Let's get started. Please reach out. Um, let me get rid of that. And let me bring that up. Okay. <laughs> hey, Gerald, how are you doing? So what I, the way I approach the markets is a little bit different, right? The way I approach the markets, um, I know most retail traders, most traders, jump onto the charts, first thing they do, you know, they download MT4, they 
look at the charts, they do up patterns, they do up indicators, they look at different reasons or um, analysis or whatever they get to get into a trade. I do it a little bit differently. I look first into the fundamentals, um, into economics, because you know I did have an economics training from before. So I look into the economics first, identify what or whether price should be going up or should be going down before I jump into the technicals to look into the, <coughs> sorry, coughing a bit. Uh, I look into technicals, look into the timing of whether to get into the trade or not, All right? So basically what I'm looking for is if I think that fundamentals or based on economics, price should be going up, then I'll look into the technicals for it to bounce off a support or for the indicators to tell me that it's pointing up or for price action to tell me that it's a potential reversal, then I'll get into the trade. If everything in the technical side is pointing down, then I'll know, hey, I'll be waiting to buy, but it's not ready right away, all right? So Rina just asked, what's the best strategy for trading um, in XAU, USD or gold? What I would say is that, <clears throat> okay, so, just to disappoint you a little bit, there's no best trading strategy. Um, it's really based on what you're comfortable with, first off, right? Well, first off is what you're comfortable with because my belief is that there's no one strategy for everyone, okay? There's no one strategy for everyone. Um, customize it to what you're comfortable with, what you're comfortable with in the, in the aspect of your trading capital, your risk appetite, and also how much time or effort you're going to put into the trades, right? Because like for myself, I trade full-time. I look at the charts all day, every day. I'm looking at H1, H4, M15, sometimes even the one-minute charts. But if you're a retail trader and you don't have that much time, you know, you might look at the charts one hour for every day or <clears throat> a couple of hours a day. Then, you know, you might want to stay on the H4 time frame something that you don't have to manage too closely, something that you can pop in, check out. If there's a setup, get into it. If not, move on with, with life, you know, look at it the next day again, okay? So one is the time frame, how much time and effort you're going to look into it. Um, the less time you have, the bigger time frame you should be looking into, all right? But that said as well, what I actually recommend to all traders or all retail traders is to, you know, stay on the H one at the very least, right? Don't go down below H1 because it gets, it tends to get a little bit noisy, it tends to get a bit messy. So if you do try and jump into the smaller time frame, you might miss or get caught out in a lot of um, short-term fluctuations, all right? <laughs> so, but that said, all right? So um, just to answer Rina a little bit more is that when you look at gold, right? Um, can you all see my chart here? Okay. When you look at gold, what I tend to do, gold, I, I don't look at it for the short term. I look for gold more in the long term time frame. So look at it on the daily and on the H4. At this point now, looking at it on a daily time frame, right? I'll highlight that <clears throat> gold has been or had tested that 1677 level first time back in August 21. And then very closely, came very close on July, when was it? July 21st, right? We came very close to that point again. So just be extra careful when you're trading gold. You know, I look at it on a daily time frame. find a key support level. Another point I noted on gold was that, it had, because I look at it on a bigger time frame, you know, you can see that downward push as well, right? That diagonal trend line towards the downside. Now with gold sitting at 1732, right? One thing I would be looking at, like Richard is asking about FIB levels. So I go down to the H4 time frame here. Look at that. Push it up. Wait, where's all my lines? Um, let me put all that in. 
All right, so there we have it. So you can see that that move up, got my fib level towards upside there. Um, Joy just said she's well, you're buying gold at this point. I wouldn't, for me, I would actually be looking at it to see what happens at this 61.8 level, right? Just nice. You can see that back in July, it's hit that level, resisted a little bit before it broke towards the upside. Right now, tracking lower. <coughs> so I want to see what happens at this point. If, if price comes down to this point and bounces, then I could be looking to buy gold back up in the short term, back towards possibly towards that trend line level, that downward trend line. But what it looks like, more likely the case, is that price is likely to come down towards 61.8 and possibly break towards the downside, right? So one thing to pay attention to when you're looking at gold is that it has some correlation to the dollar, to the dollar index, to the DXY, right? So why we're seeing this move towards the downside on gold, one of the reasons is because you can see on the DXY, we've had that big, take that away, big move towards the upside, okay? So because we've seen gold push towards the upside, also correlates to what we've seen in gold pushing towards the downside. So would it be a time to buy right now? For me, I would say I'll wait a little bit. I want to see what happens at this level there, or rather, let me take that away. I want to see what happens to this level here at 61.8. Um, if it breaks, I would look to hold, wait for it to go down further, then to buy it back up. Or if it bounces, I would look to buy it towards upside. For me, I don't look to sell gold. I only look to buy it um, towards the upside. For the longer term, I'll look for an upside move. <coughs> All right. Um, I hope that answers your question there for Rina and also for Joy. Keep the questions coming. I'm enjoying this already. All right. So Okiri, Okikiri asked, is hedging good for FX in Euro dollar? Let's have a look at it. Um, where's my Euro dollar? I, I, sorry. Okay. There it is. So Euro dollar, um, if... You know, if you're talking about hedging, I would be, it's something that can be done, but something that you should be really careful about, right? If you're talking about hedging as in, you know, to look to buy and to offset it against or to sell and to offset it against something else, shouldn't, unless you're super experienced with your trades, you shouldn't be looking at a hedge, at hedging or is aging, yeah, aging, I think you mean hedging. Right, um, try and keep it a little bit more simple. Um, I would just go on the, especially for the Euro dollar, you know, and across the pairs right now, I would say just be a little bit careful on, or it might be a lot easier just to trade it as a natural pair, right? Just as the way it runs rather than try and hedge positions. Half of that gold chart is the US dollar. It is, um, the, do the gold, gold does have a very close correlation to the dollar index, but what we also saw at some point is that there is a little bit of lag between gold and the dollar, right? So it doesn't always move in direct correlation. There's a bit of a lag. And also sometimes um, the dollar or gold does tend to lead it a little bit when we were massively, or when the markets were massively worried about, um, what was that? The global recession, you know, a recession across the world. We saw gold climbing very strongly, dollar set a little bit across before dropping. So some level of correlation, not 100%. Okay, so just be extra careful with that. But coming back to the Euro, <coughs> you know, I would, try and avoid hedging it a little bit, but I'll ask you guys a question since we've got everyone here, right? Um, Euro at that currently now approaching that parity level, 1.00. What do you guys mean? But what do you guys think? Will the Euro break lower 
Will the euro trade lower towards the downside significantly? Or do you think that it's going to come down towards that nine zero point nine nine five five level, like what it did before? Right, what it did there? You think it come down and then turn back up again? Drop all the way or drop a little bit before bouncing strongly back up? What do you think? What's going to happen to the euro dollar? Looking for your opinion here. So you got one saying it's a down, one saying it's a bounce, right? So far, right, even at 50 50. <coughs> Goes up, bounce. All right. So the bounce seems to be winning at this point. Okay. Um, at this level, let me just try and add in, trying to be a bit funny here. I'll add in a couple of things if I can find it. Um, where is my indicators? <laughs> so this was an analysis I was doing before. Um, just something that you might want to be, you might be interested in, or just something to watch out for. Uh, we have the 50. If I'm not wrong, this is the 50 moving average, and that's the 200, right? So what happens when you see a 50 moving average cross downwards from a 200 moving average? Do you guys know what is it called? And um, what, what is likely to happen at that point? If, 50, if the 50 MA crosses down from the 200 MA, so if we see this happen, Anyone? If the 50 moving average crosses down from the 200 moving average, typically, what do we call it? All right, typically it's called a death cross. Death. I'm trying to write with a mouse, so pardon my writing. Oh, no R. All right, so 50 across the 200 death cross, it does signify that we might see significant downside. So this is something that I'm watching at this point right now, um, whether we're going to see this crossover. If we do, then we might see significant downside on the euro dollar. Okay, so I'll show you an example here where we saw the 50 cross down from the 200 all right, so it is a little bit lagging, came back, it tested, but then if I zoom it out, you can see that we saw that big downward move with the euro dollar after that cross. Yep, the cross is somewhat of a confirmation of trend. So something to watch out for, it has happened once already here in June, uh, bounce back up, hit that 200 before end of June, tracking all the way down. Is that going to happen again? Let's watch out and see. Uh, simple moving average, Robert there. That's a simple moving average, 50 and 200, death cross. Okay, uh, let me just catch back a couple of questions that you guys had. Um, what does it mean by hedge, right? Okay, so the Euro dollar, I think, right? And I don't really want to elaborate on this because I don't want too many people trying this out. Um, when you hedge, you try and maybe buy the euro dollar or sell the euro dollar at this point, and then <coughs> um, in a corresponding pair, for example, the uh, euro Swiss franc or the euro pound or the euro yen, you, you get into an opposite position, right? Or the US Swiss franc as well, uh, with that correlation, you get into the opposite position. So expecting one to drop, expecting one to go up, you try and hedge it off. Um, to try and take advantage of a little bit of lag in price movements. It can be done, a little bit tricky to be done, so just be extra careful if you're trying to do um, any hedging. All right. Um, another, another way of how people hedge is when they, let me just clear all that out. Another way of hedging is when they, for example, in this case, sell the euro down, but then if it bounces back up, you know, they take a buying position, for the short term towards upside while it's looking to drop down again. 
So many ways to hedge positions, either on the same pair or across other pairs, correlated pairs, but you know, try and keep it a little bit more simple. All right. So I've got that one. Let me see what else. You guys got the death cross, fantastic. All right. Uh, Brian said, I'm buying gold. It's just above the 61.8 and on H4 it is, right? So while it's above that 61.8, I want to see a, which is happening now, still a little bit early because it is on H4, but I want to see that rejection of that 61.8 to signal a good buying position, which is happening quite close, right? It's coming to that point. Um, if you're a little bit more of a risk taker, could look into that, right? An idea here is, let me just take that away. An idea here is that you could be looking for that buying opportunity, maybe 1737, right? Stop loss just below that 61.8 level and then take profit, I would say back to that trend line level. A good one is to fall risk reward ratio towards upside. Um, a little bit early, what I would prefer is that if it comes down, test that level without breaking before bouncing back up, then I would say that would be a stronger trade up. All right. Okay, there we go. Um, on the euro dollar, can we check CCI and ADX? Okay. You, okay, so the thing is that one other thing to add on to Joy's question about adding CCI and ADX is, you know, just be a little bit careful um, when you're trying to add too many indicators or too many uh, confirmations, right? Confirmations, because what happens is that it's never going to all line up, right? It's never going to all line up at the same time. So you want to choose a couple of different ones, right? A couple of different ones and then stick to those just to give you enough information to take on a trade, right? And don't get me wrong, you know, it's never going to be a situation where you have a 100% confident trade or 100% um, risk-free trade or um, a sure trade, a sure win trade. So put a few of a strategy together and then apply that there's always going to be a level of probability and risk to it. But if you're comfortable and confident with it, then that's reasonable. So let's check CCI. Um, hmm? Wait, where is it? CCI, put that on. Um, I know the ADX works very well. All right, so we do, we do have it pointing a little bit. We do have a little bit of expected of a fluctuation on the H4. If you look at on H1, we might see it retrace. So this is where it might tell you that it's going to retrace a little bit before turning back down again. So possibly, um, I do think that it's going to retrace a little bit, but just be a little bit careful on um, having too many indicators at this point, okay? Um, I see your question there on Ethereum. So let's look at that. <coughs> Sylvanus, Sylvanus. Righty. Um, based on my previous analysis, so, right? So I was looking at that move towards upside. It actually happened a lot earlier than I expected. So let's take that away. When will be the best time to buy Ethereum? Mm. <coughs> I'll put in a level here, right? At that 15.74, because it bounced off, it bounced off. It's sitting right there right now. If it does break towards the upside, I would say be a little bit careful because we have had that big downward move since the 14th, since last week on Ethereum towards the downside, I think that we might see a bit more of a further move towards the downside, possibly towards the 1400 level and then a bounce, right? So 
we might see it push towards upside there, but I think any push towards upside might be met with a further down. I'll be looking for a reaction at about 1400 for that more longer term or more sustained move towards the upside. Okay, um, so possibly, unfortunately, not right now, not just yet. Any move might is likely to be kept at about 1650. Right, you might see move being kept at 1650 before turning back down again. So just be a bit careful there. If you really had to buy, or if it doesn't turn towards a downside, <clears throat> then I would only look to get in above 1650 uh, for that push towards the, towards the upside. But looks like it's gonna turn down again. <coughs> All right. Um, audio is a bit low. Can you guys hear me? I'll just move my mic a little bit nearer if that helps. Let me know if that helps, John. Um, Mane Mane asked, Death Cross, can we look at an H1 and M15? You can, um, but it will be stronger. You're going to see a more significant move on the on the H4, I'll show you an example there is that if we applied that 5200 on the M15, right, you're going to see, you do see it work. So that crossover, we did see that big move towards the downside. But, you know, that cross up is called a golden cross. Um, didn't happen. We didn't see a big move towards the upside. And then that crossover, we did see that downside, but then um, a crossover here, we saw some move, but it came in very delayed, right? So just be a little bit careful. It does work on multiple time frames, but um, it works stronger. You can see a more significant move on the H4 time frame. Okay, you can apply it to H1 or M15, but just make sure you bear in mind the previous trend, right? So why this golden cross here, why this cross here didn't work was because of that significant downward move, not really a strong reversal indicator, uh, more a confirmation towards the downside. That's why this worked very well and this one didn't work as well. <laughs> okay. On the euro dollar, I see a buy to the upside into an order block and then selling down again. Please, is that right? <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm coughing a little bit as well, so just bear with me there, guys. All right, so euro dollar, yeah, I, you know, we do expect, I do expect a lot of volatility at this point, very similar to what happened here, right? What very similar to what happened here in July. It came down, it hit that level, it bounced strongly came back down, hit that level, bounced strongly again. Parity level, round number, support level, key psychological level. Um, we are going to see a lot of activity, a lot of traders positioned to buy at this point as well. So you're not wrong there, uh, Gideon. Could see a big buying opportunity before a push lower again. That's also why we haven't seen that crossover. And also like when we saw here, Despite a crossover, we saw a push towards the upside, reject that 200 level before turning back down again. I don't think we'll see it come all the way up, but I think we might see it push up towards that, that 101.0080 level, maybe before turning back down again. So yeah, you're on point there. What happened when you take profit and not and did not take losses? Um, it's one of my strategy. What did you think about that? Um, very tricky, very tricky if you if you aim to take profits and not losses because what could happen is that if you can't manage the trades, if you can't manage the losses, then you know it could end up with nothing. Right? You could be making money, making money, and then one big loss could wipe out all the profits and even capital as well. So just be extra careful with that. <clears throat> um, if you take profits only and not losses, 
it could have a uh, very big impact on your trade there. Okay, got your trade in. And I see a question there on Dow, so I'll get to that later shortly. Um, gold 1733. Let's look at gold. You guys love gold. All right, 1733. Oh, you just caught that tail there at about 1733. Take profit 1760. Stop loss 1727. That makes sense. I would say that makes sense as a trade, a good risk to reward, um, good rejection of that 61.8 level could work. I, I hope it works for you as well. <laughs> um, an order block, or uh, what we would say is a bit of a demand zone is when you see prices or you see um, <coughs> price drop to that level sit at level and possibly shoot up. So that's usually when we have a support or a resistance level. In this case of the Euro, right? A lot of traders could be anticipating that the Euro dollar will bounce strongly from this point, right? Could be anticipating that Euro dollar will bounce strongly from this point. So what happens is they put a pending buy, right? You put a pending buy order for price. Once it comes down to that point, they'll buy in, push towards upside, right? Or another pending order is when a lot of traders have stop losses just below that parity level, right? If they have stop loss just below that, price comes down, hits their stop loss. What happens is they would have to close out the trade, means a buying um, an order goes through again. So what we usually see is an order, what we call an order block or demand zone in those areas there. Okay, that's why we also see a lot of volatility um, at very key support levels or key resistance levels because a lot of trades or a lot of orders are being placed within those levels. All right. Um, I see a question from Justin on parabolic SAR. I'll get to that just after I get into this um, sell opportunity on the Aussie yen. All right, so let's look at Aussie yen. There we go. <clears throat> Let me clear out some lines. So I'll take, well, take that away as well. Okay. So Aussie yen selling opportunity at 94.96. So it's about, oh, 94.96. Okay, I like that. So 94.96 is about right there. Okay, so selling opportunity, stop loss at 95.79, 95.79, about there. Okay, so above that previous high, where's your take profit there? Um, Dal Lux Olo. Sorry if I'm getting your name wrong, but let me know. All right, where's your take profit going to be if that's your 95.79 is your stop loss? Okay, um, I see a question there, Rina, as well, and Kingsley. I'll get to that shortly. So at this point, what I would say is that it does make some sense for the <coughs> um, Aussie yen, possible downside, right? Why, why possible downside on the Aussie yen? How I look at it is first Aussie dollar, right? Aussie dollar at this point looking like, you know, it's bouncing a little bit. We might see this push towards the downside with that trend pushing towards the downside. So if that happens, then pushing lower, we could see the Aussie yen trade lower. But watch out here. We are seeing some demand, demand uh, block towards the ups or order block or push towards the upside here. So that actually coincides with what we think on the Aussie yen, right? Um, I think that we might have it right that we could see it push up, hit that level, turn down because Aussie dollar pushing up, we could see it climb up, 
but overall downtrend and then turning down towards that point, towards that 90.97. Oh, that's a very far level. 90.97 is about there, or 93. Um, just be extra careful. I think that's a very big level or very big take profit level to be expecting. Um, a few things to watch out for will be a few interim levels at about 93. And again, at about 90, at about 92 as well, a few key levels that you need to watch out for, right? So I wouldn't, for me, I wouldn't be looking for a big move towards that 90.97 level. I would say that if you're looking to sell it down, right, look for that move, look for that rejection of that 95 level, sell it down. I think stop loss could be a little bit tighter towards 95, maybe 95.55. Okay, so I'll show you as a trade idea, what I would tweak a little bit differently is I would say, look for rejection of that 95 level. Stop loss about 60 something pips towards the downside, take profit towards the first level at about 170 pips towards the downside. With that, you would have a uh, one is to 2.6 uh, risk to reward towards the downside for Aussie yen, right? And that's depending, or that would be dependent on the Aussie dollar dropping quite significantly. We could expect the yen to drop, but I think more likely this move will have to be dependent on the Aussie dollar dropping. Okay, so I hope I answered your question there. Um, Next one was pound Aussie. Let's look at a pound Aussie. Okay, so and while I'm looking at the pound Aussie, I will answer Justin's question as well on the parabolic SAR. <coughs> okay, parabolic SAR, something to look at. Right, parabolic SAR is basically those dots. Right, those dots um, that gives you a bit of a momentum or to show you whether momentum is strong or weak in either direction. Uh, parabolic SAR, at the SAR means stop and reverse. So what happens is that when you look at price above the parabolic SAR, we're seeing it push towards upside and prices below the parabolic SAR, we see it push towards the downside things to pay attention to in this case is that you don't want to just trade based on the parabolic SAR alone, right? Not just based on that alone. And when price comes close, right? And price has no direction or comes close to the parabolic SAR that shows you that it's likely to stop and reverse. That's where the SAR comes in, a stop and reverse. So in this case, for the pound Aussie dollar, you can see that parabolic SAR was far, is far from the price, it's far, and now it came close, but then now it's far from price again. So it looks like we're going to see further downside on the pound Aussie, right? Uh, why I say don't use it alone is that I would have to look for it to break below that 1.7038 level then we're going to see a big downside move. Once it breaks that support level, we're going to see a big downside move because when was the last time it got to this level? <coughs> right? Looking at it on the daily time frame, it's a long time since it got to that level. And also on the daily time frame, you can see price <coughs> approaching very close to that parabolic SAR there. All right? So if it does hit that level, touch that parabolic SAR, what happens is the dot will appear so once it touches that, the dot will appear to the upside there, right? And then that's going to give you more momentum to push price towards the downside. <clears throat> With that as well, take note on the daily time frame here. <clears throat> we do have a, what's this pattern? Can you guys tell me this three candlestick pattern that's forming um, on the Aussie, on the pound Aussie dollar? <clears throat> it's three candlestick pattern forming on the pound Aussie dollar. 
Okay, so that's a three, nope, uh, three, not three soldiers, three white soldiers is towards the upside, which we saw this one there, right? This is the three black crows indicating possible downside move. So it hit that support level. We saw a reversal with a three white soldiers. <clears throat> it hit that level. And now we see that tracking back down again. So this would be a confluence where we have a three black crows pointing towards a reversal. If price breaks below that support, we're going to see more downside. Um, if the PSAR gets hit, it appears towards upside, pushing price lower. So how it looks like, we might see further downside on the pound or Z dollar. Remember, please do your due diligence and analysis before you jump into any trades. Alrighty. Okay, uh, what should be the best partner for parabolic SAR for profitable trading? I would say that you know you could do parabolic SAR together with um, support levels like we've just done here. You could be looking at um, parabolic SAR together with uh, overall trend, a good level as well. Okay. Um, is there any trading stocks, futures, Forex that doesn't take fundamental analysis into consideration? <clears throat> hey, Dixon, it's really um, a way to approach it, right? So you could be trading without considering the um, levels. You could, you could do it without considering the fundamentals. If you look at it on the daily time frame or on to the... Um, out on the four hourly time frame, just to you know ride through the fundamental impact. So it could be one way, you know, look at a bigger time frame without considering the fundamentals. Okay, that might be a shortcut there, um, but I think that it will still, as a wholesome approach, it will still be good to consider the fundamentals as well. Just a brief cast. You don't have to fully um, understand it or read every uh, report and understand every number but you just need to know for example that there is a big news coming up something to watch out for what to pay attention to all right <clears throat> there is a lot of um, news to be had for this week all right so not much today it's been quite quiet today but you know there is PMI purchasing managers index to be released tomorrow for the eurozone, for the UK as well. But not a big change expected, despite PMIs indicating the contractionary phase. Um, we do have the US GDP to be released on Thursday, looking not like a very good number at a minus expected minus zero point eight percent. Looking at you know further quarter on quarter contractions for the US. And most importantly, we do have the Jackson Hole Symposium that's happening. It applies to all central banks. They're all meeting and discussing. That's why we're gonna see, you know, possibly some high volatility moves on Friday. So watch out for that. Um, what else? Let me see. <laughs> What's the best setting in using parabolic SAR? I'll just use the standard. So the standard, if I'm not wrong, is, um, I actually don't know what the calculations is, but if you just apply the standard, that would work. So just, if you're using MT4, you can find the fundament, you can find the parabolic SAR. If you're doing the, on, on trading view, just apply it as a standard. Um, I'm, I will feedback there, Dixon, I'll feedback on to, you know, having a fundamental analysis seminar. I'm pretty sure that will be on the cards. So watch out for that. Alrighty. Um, pound risky till we know who the next PM is on 6th of September. I'll stay well clear. Um, the pound dollar is risky, but I think, you know, from my view, the, the next PM is possibly not going to have too much of an impact on the pound dollar, right? It's going to have some impact, but it's not going to possibly, um, in this case, not going to change the direction of the pound dollar, right? I think that we might actually see um, the decisions from the 
um, what was it? The decisions from the Bank of England to actually have a bigger impact on the pound dollar in the case of whether they're going to continue increasing rates at 50 basis points, given that the UK has had you know, bad economic, bad GDP data, um, inflation is still climbing, interest rates are climbing, economic activity is low, entering to the stagflation phase. So I think the actions of the Bank of England possibly going to have more impact than the selection of the next PM. Um, okay, I'm seeing the trade sense premium indicator on trading view. I haven't I haven't checked that out. I will check it out later and um possibly joy or get back to you on the trade sense premium. I think the VIP room is going to be starting up soon. So watch out for that. Uh, we can always get more information through that. If there's one advice you could give your younger self as a beginner trader, what would that be? Um, don't be greedy, right? So Kojo asked a question. If there's one advice you can give to your uh, younger self as a beginner trader, what would that be? It's don't be greedy. Um, why I say that is because when I first started trading, you know, I traded all the time. I was buying and selling at every moment, um, ignoring trend, ignoring a lot of things. Now it's the more sensible way to approach it would be to follow a setup, right? If it's trending down, I wait for it to turn down before getting to a trade instead of you know, buying it for the short term and selling it for the longer term. So don't be greedy, be a bit more, be a lot more patient, keeps trading a lot more enjoyable that way. I hope that helps you there, Kojo. All right, can, I, can you be my mentor and guide me through my trading career? Hey, Bernard, I'll be happy to do that. Um, there is going to be a VIP room set up for Tick Mill um, clients. So do watch out for that. Um, we can always help you through your trading career or trading journey from there. Right. Timothy, welcome. You joined late, but you're following. Um, this is recorded. So watch out for the recordings. I think you can catch it back when we have, when it's being uploaded. Uh, one of the candidates weakened the pound dollar because of the comments they made on the future role of the Bank of England. You know, the Bank of England is always, or the central banks are always going to be independent parties. So I think that comments possibly going to only have a short-term impact, not a long-term impact on the pound dollar. How do we use Fibonacci retracements on the charts? Quite straightforward is that you can be, you know, Fibonacci is there. What you want to do, right? Show you the H four time frame is to let me just remove that as well. Okay, you look for uh, turning points, right? Look for turning points. In this case, as an example, if you just did that bottom of the point all the way to the top, right? That's your Fibonacci, and then you can actually see from that point um, the sixty one. Pay attention to the sixty one, the fifty levels at the 23.6 levels you can actually see how price hesitates at those points right it's trading down hesitated at a 61.8 bounce back up once it breaks lower <coughs> kind of invalidates that level already comes back up does test a little bit before trading back it did test that 50 level again before turning down again All right so Straightforward. I'm sure we can do a Fibonacci session as well. Um, look forward to that. Is that you know you look for the lowest point. You go from the left side to the highest point on the right side to draw a Fibonacci level. All right. Yep. Okay. Yes. Don't fall. Don't don't predict the market. Right. Don't predict the market. Wait for the setup that comes to you. Trade what you see, not what you think. Um, I uh, I will check. I think this will be uploaded into the YouTube or possibly sent out. Let me just check. Um, we'll get that back out to you guys. Kojo, at what point did you realize your aha moment in trading? There is, there is no, I can tell you that I have no aha moment with trading, with my trading. Um, it was a progressive thing. It was not one moment that I went, oh, 
you know, I start making a lot of money. Um, it's it was a progressive thing. I just kept trading, and then at some point, my over the long term, I realized that hey, I was losing less or stressing out less about the trades, and then actually making more um, if my trades. So it wasn't an aha moment to say. It was you know on evaluation, I realized that hey, the curve started getting stronger towards upside rather than being zigzaggy um, with no clear directions. Uh, Rainy, watch out, you know, the trading room on Tickmill, it is coming. I don't know the details, but I'm sure that they will be sending out the info to you sooner than you think, All right? So watch out for that. What should be the least amount to start trading if you're a beginner? Hey, start trading with, uh, pretty much any amount that you can afford, right? Try the most that you can afford. I would say a thousand dollars, five hundred to a thousand dollars is a good starting point. A thousand would be better. Um, if you can, five thousand dollars would be the best trading. I started at ten, right, and I've built it progressively. I've lost money, I've made money, but ten, I was comfortable with that. So start trading with whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. I'm using FIB where we put our stop loss. I mean, using FIB, you put your stop loss just above. You don't want to use FIB alone, right? So never use one indicator alone or one strategy alone or one indicator alone. You know, put it in a pair. I'll always put my stop loss level just above a FIB level, right? If you're looking to sell it down, then this is a 50 level. Put it just above that Fibonacci level because that Fibonacci level protects your stop loss. So you have two additional protections, the Fib level and then your stop loss protecting your accounts. All right. Um, do you have any recommended books for new starters? A lot of books, right? Um, you know, read, just go search a lot of books, read everything you can. Um, but I would say nothing beats that practice beats, nothing beats that experience. So trading is all about, you know, that screen time in front of this, you know, trades, watching the charts, watching how price moves. Even if you don't enter a trade, watching how price moves gets you that um, idea or that feel of the trade. You know, um, not many people would say it, but, you know, I, I would say read the book if you really have nothing else to do. But, you gain more from watching the price movements than you would reading about a strategy or a book. What would you say is your ideal trading strategy? I say, hey, ideal trading strategy. Um, what I do now, right? what I do now, a combination using economics, right, giving me the overall view, the fundamental view, and then a trend following strategy, a trend following. I'll follow the trend. I'll have one or two indicators, price action to show me a rejection of a resistance level or a breakthrough of a support level. Um, just that price action alone together with the fundamentals gives me um, a great trading strategy. Right? So how I would approach it is that you know, I would look at, for example, <laughs> um, on Thursday, at 8.30, expecting the US GDP to be bad, to be a negative number. We're going to see some downside on the dollar. Then I'll be looking for fluctuations for some dollar weakness. Right? In this case, I might even be looking at the US yen. You know, If it fails to break higher, then in this case, dollar weakness will pull the US yen towards the downside. I'll be looking for the USD and to break below 136.70 to sell it down, All right? So I look at fundamentals and then the trend. Um, the fundamental, I would say fundamentals, technicals, then leads to sentiment because a lot of sentiment is being drawn from the technicals or being applied to the technicals already. So fundamentals, technicals, and then sentiment, put it all together. How do you get your confluence to show your analysis? Uh, yeah, you know, I put my fundamentals together with my technicals, confluence of ideas for my analysis on whether to buy or to sell um, the pair towards upside or the downside. 
okay do you give signals on your vip account no we don't send out signals we more likely um pull out the analysis share with you our thoughts guide you through your trading journey that way you know you can get a lot more value out of that so watch out for that okay fantastic any other questions you guys have been awesome you guys have been superb I'm taking a challenge on a funded account. Is there any advice for me, please? Yeah, um, you know, funded account challenges manage that risk. Um, you know, you don't have to hammer out too many trades. So look for that good trade setups. Avoid avoid the news because nowadays the news do tend to move a little bit erratically. So that could have a big negative impact on your challenge. So avoid the news. Look at it on the H4 time frame. A few good trades will go miles for you um, in that challenge. And all good luck for that as well. You know, let me know how you go with that. Um, if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. Best time to trade in your trading session, it's whatever time you get to sit in front of the screen, right? Um, I can tell you that I don't trade on mobile. I always like trading in front of the screen gets me set up ready to trade rather than trading on the fly um, on the mobile. Um, you know, if you can set up time to trade during the US session, first best time is to trade during the US session. If not, then the Euro session will be a good time to trade, which is about now. But at this time will be a great time to be trading. And that's also why we do the session, just so that we can uh, show you some charts, show you how the price is moving, you can actually see price moving at this time compared to, I'll show you here an example. This was during the Asia session, you know, price barely moved. And then as we got into the Euro session, price started moving again. So, you know, take it around that time, around this time. <clears throat> All righty. Um, do you d trade demand and supply strategy? If yes, what is your take on it? Hey, um, I don't specifically trade on the demand and supply strategy, but I do consider um, my support and resistance levels as demand and supply zones. So at some level, yes, I do consider it, but not specifically on the demand and supply strategy. It is a little bit of a self-fulfilling approach because once it comes to that point, it bounces. Um, you can use other strategies, together with the demand or the support and resistance levels all right um, averagely how many years would it take to a beginner trader to turn to be a profitable trader how long did it take me it took me about two two years it took me about two years right to be confidently profitable um you know i and when i first started there were days i'll make a lot and the days i'll lose but to be confidently profitable about two years. It's not how many years it takes. It's about how much time you have to spend, right? Someone who I used to spend three, four hours a day when I first started looking at the charts um, and did it every day as well. And, you know, it's a different trading conditions. When I started trading, it was trading during the GFC, the global financial crisis. So that gives me a lot of experience in high volatility trading. You know, compared to a couple of year or year last year when it's a little bit more subdued, different ways, different market conditions. So, you know, build it up. It's not about checking the boxes, but it's about building up that experience. How do you trade counter trend? I would say that, you know, <coughs> um, counter trend trades is the same as a trend following trade, just that it's a little bit more predictive. A little bit more predictive. You're looking for a reaction of a support level or resistance level. My standard approach is always to suggest using or trading based on trend following first. Make that a confident approach, then start looking to some counter trend trades. Even for now, I only approach trades mostly on trend following, trying to avoid counter trend trades as much as I can. All right. Can you talk about the FIB levels below the zero and above 100? Um, those will be projection levels. Those will be Fibonacci projection levels. I think that as a 
um, first approach, look at it based on the does those levels first. If you're looking at those beyond, oops, beyond a hundred, uh, that's our, those are projection levels. Different way to use it. We could be looking, um, possibly. I'll suggest to the team to do a Fibonacci session. So watch out for that. What do you recommend? for of time frame that is the entering a trade if you're entering if you're analyzing on h4 time frame then enter a trade on h4 time frame if you're entering if you're analyzing your trade on an h1 enter a trade on the h1 time frame so there's really no um, time frame to enter a trade i would say enter a trade based on whichever time frame you are analyzing on right and also exit the trade based on any time frame that you, that you entered it based on as well. So see a trade on H4, stick to the H4, enter and exit based on H4. All righty. Good stuff. So as we come to the end of the session, please let me know, did you have a good session? Was this helpful? Um, I will feed back to, to the team about a Fibonacci uh, and a fundamentals uh, seminar. And then uh, watch out for the VIP room that will be coming up soon. Information will be sent out to you shortly as well, I believe. A very solid experience. Fantastic. I'm glad you enjoyed the session there, Joy and Gideon. Thank you all. I will check with that on that, Bernard. All righty. So with that, make sure you trade well, trade safe. Take care now. Bye-bye.